I saw a t-shirt once that I really wanted to buy, but I couldn't find it. A friend of mine was wearing it. It said, procrastinators, the leaders of tomorrow. <laughs> I have been a procrastinator my entire life. I'm so good at it, I don't really intend to ever change. So I'm accustomed to this sense that I'm running out of time and it really doesn't bother me. This is not a good thing. <laughs> I graduated from Loma Linda University at Y2K. I was careful not to be there just in case the computer crisis that was alleged to occur actually amounted to anything, which it didn't. Um, but around that time, uh, from 1996 to 2000 when I was at Loma Linda, I really wanted to get out of what I called the armpit of America, San Bernardino County, and get back to kind of the setting where I grew up. I grew up here in Greenville, Tennessee. Uh, we moved here in the 70s and I uh, left to go to Pisgah for a few years before I got exasperated with Adventist education and I left to go to public school. And uh, then um, went to Loma Linda for my medical training and uh, decided I had had enough of, uh, of the big city and uh, wanted to do some country living. I vowed to the Lord that I would every, once I left Loma Linda, I was going to be in something more rural. Wherever I lived and was, it was going to be something more rural than that. I mean, I might not move straight to the mountains because I had to do residency and internship and those type of things. But I was going to be, uh, I wanted to kind of get back and, and, and enjoy nature and move into a setting, uh, I think which Ellen White describes as a setting which man has never been able to improve on the setting of a garden and where God originally designed the human family to be. So I left Loma Linda and uh, started kind of considering where I wanted to live. I was a year in Spokane, Washington area and enjoyed uh, the fellowship of the Countryside SDA Church up there near Spokane for a while, and then moved to a cornfield in Nebraska. I, I did uh, my training in anesthesiology in Omaha, Nebraska, and uh, by the time I uh, left Nebraska, I, I sold that house and have been doing part-time locum travel medicine for the past, uh, you know, probably 15, 16, 17 years or so, about something like that lived out of a suitcase in my car for about four years straight and did mission trips overseas uh, for a while. But the desire to do that was driven by this idea that uh, I started studying and learning a bit more about during what most people refer to now as the credit crisis uh, or the recession of 2008. Any of you kind of remember going through that experience? Uh, some do, some don't. That's just how old I am. I remember a lot about it. And I was uh, fortunate enough to, uh, I sold um, pretty much all the stocks I had that I was actually forced to buy. I, when I became an employee of University Hospital, we had a retirement fund. You didn't have a choice. It was just taken out of your paycheck. It was Tia Kref. And uh, so when I was on staff there, um, and, I, and then I quit because they didn't give me enough time to do mission trips. So I quit. And I cashed out all the, the retirement account that was there, got out of the stock market, and took, I don't know, it was like 20% penalty or something for doing that. And, uh, I, but I didn't care. I just, I didn't want someone else to have that. I wanted it for myself. And uh, I felt that it would be better to actually own a physical asset rather than something that was a ethereal paper, who knows what value it might be next year. And so I, I sold the house, got rid of all the stocks. Actually, I, I rented my place to, some, to a resident, actually, while I was traveling. So he helped pay the mortgage. And um, at that time, I started listening to D Pastor Dave Westbrook. I signed up with his Country Living University online way back in the day, around 2008-ish, 9-ish, something like that. And I just vowed I was going to do everything he, he said to do and do it the way he did it. Is anybody here familiar with Pastor Dave Westbrook and the Country Living Online University plan that he, that he had? So I also watched his uh, video, Out of the Cities, that was you know, very new back then. And things weren't near as bad as they are now back then. 
but I decided I was going to find country property. So I um, first, as he said, looked for employment. Well, the travel gig made it easy. I had a number of options that I could go and live and work someplace rural. And the places I looked were outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. There was, uh, I worked there for a while, and I worked in, um, it's not Bay Mayberry, it's um, Mount Airy, where the, the television show was based. I actually got my hair cut by the guy who is featured in, in the Andy Griffith show. And you know, all the pictures were on the wall and everything, and he was like 80, I don't know what, and he nicked my neck. And, but it was kind of a neat experience, you know, and he had everybody's picture on the wall and a bunch of autographs. So I was there, and I thought, well, this is rural, you know, and I've got a job. But there was another one in Crossville, Tennessee, that was an option, and I had gone to a couple times. And uh, I ended up being there, and I rented for one year, based on Pastor Westbrook's advice, and um, I was convinced that, at, you know, at that time, we'd been about two years into the housing crash that was associated with the credit crisis, because nobody could get credit, nobody could buy the houses, the prices went way down. Um, and like, uh, unlike now, where people have fled metropolitan areas in the pandemic period and tried to buy up rural properties, the inverse was happening back then. Back then, people were trying to get into the cities, into the cheap housing that was flooding the market. And so uh, rural properties were even cheaper. You know, I saw land in Crossville for two, three thousand dollars an acre, and now you're lucky to see it for eight thousand dollars an acre, 15 years later. So Pastor Westbrook had said that he too, in his journey, looking for country living, um, had bought, uh, had rented for a bit, feeling a little awkward that you're going to lose that money to someone else when you could have like used that to buy something that you owned. But he said what had happened for him is the price co prices continued to fall. And then when he actually had looked around for a year to make sure he had a good location that was lower in crime, that had good soil, that didn't have questionable neighbors, that offered employment, and such. He bought and saved something like $180,000 because the price had actually gone down on the property he was looking at by that amount in a year. So I thought, wow, what a blessing, what an incredible miracle. I, I, it would be nice if something like maybe a little bit like that happened. Maybe I'll save $50,000 or something. So I rented for a year and um, told my real estate agent, who, who found me a great place to rent, I told her exactly what I was looking for, and for over 12 months she brought me nothing at all <laughs> that resembled what I had asked for. And so I was praying about it and said, Lord, I don't get it. Why can't, you know, she did such a nice job finding me this rental. Why is it that this is going so poorly? And I felt to him say, you know, the Lord will, you know, and that is just the next promise. Yeah, this was another thing Pastor Westbrook had mentioned that I really liked this promise that God will help his people find such homes outside the cities. And uh, he also had another quote, I don't think I have it, where you could find homes that have fruit trees bearing and, you know, everything's kind of set up. You just move in kind of turnkey because at the time I did not have a green thumb at all. I mean, I had grown up uh, gardening with my, my folks and my grandparent, my grandfather specifically, but I hadn't done that for a long time. And so I, I was praying that the Lord would have some place for me that already had stuff going, that I could get a jump start. Because I felt that at that time, as much as people hear it now, it was almost maybe even more back then that the currency is going to become devalued. You know, you're going to be stuck with the debt that you have. Um, you just need to get settled quickly because time is short. And like I said, I'm a procrastinator. I'm accustomed to that. It doesn't really <laughs> scare me as much as it should. But I felt um, that other people in the church that I would listen to or talk with had this unusual, more so than me, an unreasonable confidence that everything was going to be okay, even if they made no preparatory, <laughs> took no preparatory action whatsoever. Because after all, they'd been in Pathfinders. They could camp. You know, when the Sunday law comes, they would just, you know, leave their home and everything would go hunky-dory. Or maybe angels would drive up in a big limo and this red carpet would roll out, 
and they're going to take you to some mountain secluded home and chop your wood for you. I, I never bought that scenario that people seem to believe in and felt that, you know, if, if things are going to go that bad that soon, I need to like get out there and get set up for what's coming. And I didn't know how. So I thought, well, I better do it now so that, you know, in a couple years or whenever, at least I'll have things set up and I'll be a little bit more prepared than just driving away in my Honda, you know. So I was looking and I couldn't find anything and the Lord said, listen, I'm going to help you find such homes. Uh, your real estate lady is just not on board with this. <laughs> so I went behind her back and started looking. Now, she, she of course, wanted to sell me uh, 350, which back then was expensive. Now, you're lucky to find a three-bedroom home for $350,000. But back then, 350000 which is kind of the market she was searching for me in, uh, would buy a big acreage with a five-bedroom home and, you know, water, stuff like that. You, you don't see that anymore. And, but I thought that was expensive. That, she was way above my price range, and she wanted a 6%, you know, cut on a $400,000 property. So I was looking at, I wanted to see the foreclosures because with the credit crisis, I knew there were a lot of people who had, who had lost their homes, had spent a lot of money paying the mortgage, and I wanted, kind of like coming out of Egypt, I wanted all the jewels and all the, you know, the goods that I was gonna take away from worldly people just before getting to Canaan land. So I started looking at uh, foreclosures and I couldn't find anything. And I discovered that the, all the real estate people were cherry picking all that stuff first for themselves and their friends and family before it ever hit the market. And so I had to figure out a way to find stuff uh, without them telling me about it. So I went to a home and looked at it and looked that home up online because I couldn't get in the house. I just went out driving around to see houses. Uh, I think it was Southern Prudential had a sign in the front yard and I looked them up online and they had a tab for foreclosures up in the right hand corner of the screen. So I clicked on foreclosures, entered my search criteria, and the second home that came up on the screen was the home I eventually bought in a few weeks. The first one that came up was a lovely log cabin, but because I had spent a year searching and had talked with the sheriff's office and police department, I knew that that home was in a troubled area that had methamphetamine manufacturing businesses going on and so I didn't want to live in that area. So even though it was a great home, great price, $100,000 property or something like that, which I then was able to pay cash for my house because I had sold my home back in Omaha and saved my money for the past couple years. The second home uh, was, uh, that I found was listed at $148,000. It too was a log cabin in the woods and it had an outbuilding, and actually had two outbuildings. They weren't listed on the internet site, but uh, there was police tape all around this house. And uh, I went out and looked at it, and it seemed okay to me. I was worried maybe it was a murder scene or something, and it had fallen into foreclosure, and, and um, the decks were kind of falling apart outside. There were like six decks. And the pictures online did not at all do it justice. I had learned in about a year and a half that all the pictures online for real estate tended to be very uh, complimentary and almost exaggerated in their niceties. But then when you would go in person, the property was really not as nice as it appeared online. This property was the opposite. Online, it looked like it wasn't very nice. Uh, but when you got there in person, it was this massive log cabin mansion um, with a two-car garage and an apartment on top, and then a large um, log home barn on the back. And it had uh, grapevines growing. There were blackberry bushes all over the place. There was an old unused garden plot. There was garlic growing out of the ground. It, the, the roof of the house faced exactly south for solar and for the, for the garden plot that was symmetrically laid out to the side of it. You couldn't see any other houses because of the trees that surrounded me. I was on a hill. Um, it was just a great location. But um, nobody, I guess, was interested in it. It had been abandoned and in foreclosure for several years. I made an offer on it. 
And um, I was on call at the hospital when I made the decision. I prayed for two weeks. I said, Lord, if this is the property, I don't want to make a mistake. I've been looking at the property for a long time. I don't want to sell. I don't want to buy and be in this market and need to sell. It was not a good time to sell. It was a great time to buy, not a good time to sell. So I um, prayed about it two, two weeks, felt this is a place for me. Uh, I'd also come to the point where I hope many of you have too. There is no perfect property, but there's property that's good enough for you to do good work. So I accepted that as property. The thing I lacked was water, but there was water on the adjacent five-acre lot that was unoccupied. And uh, I had a roof line that I could probably catch 200 gallons in a day. Um, I'm trying to figure out what details I want to give you when. Uh, this property uh, had a 2,000 square foot log home that um, was built in 1972 out of uh, reclaimed timber from the valley underneath in Bledsoe County. And it was done really nice. Um, and then it had a 5,000 square foot addition that had been built between 2003 and 2008 or 10 when it fell into foreclosure. Then there was the garage apartment built in 1982 where someone had been living above the garage and then the barn I learned later was built by somebody's grandfather who wanted to, came up and wanted to know what was going on. And so it's nice buildings. The other buildings of course were not shown online so nobody knew about them unless you would come. Freddie Mae Fannie Mac owned the place and it had listed, I later learned, a lot of this I learned later and I didn't know, I just felt moved that this was the place for me. I put in a bid when I was there at the hospital that Friday, I said I'll give them what they're asking and the price had fallen to I think 130-ish thousand, I had seen it at 148, it fell to 130 in two weeks, I said I'll make you a cash offer and the real estate agent said, I'll give him a call. Didn't know Fannie Mae Fannie Mac had it. She called me back in about an hour and said, they will not take a verbal offer. It has to be in writing. Someone else already has pending finances on it. I said, well, I'm call I can't leave the hospital. It's almost 5 o'clock on a Friday. Listen, if the Lord wants me to have this house, I'll see you on Monday. All right, I got to go. She called me Monday morning. Hey, I've got some news for you. The financing for the other couple fell through and they lowered the price to $112,000. Which was good because I immediately spent the $18,000 that I just saved putting in new heating and cooling units. Um, when they came to inspect it, uh, they said they were surprised that it didn't blow the place up because the heating and the gas, which was natural gas. I have natural gas and it would have cost $25,000 to run the line from the street to the house, but it already had natural gas in both the garage and the cabin. So she said, okay, good news if you want it, it's yours. Um, just come and sign papers for your cash offer, but I'm telling you, it's a foreclosure, this is gonna be a nightmare, it's not gonna go well, it takes forever, but if this is really what you want, I'll do this with you. Of course, she was disappointed, she was only gonna get $6,000 instead of the you know, $24,000 commission on a bigger piece of property. But, it wasn't my problem. So I bought it and it turned out I closed in two weeks. It took only two weeks. She said it was going to take about nine months for me to get the property. It took two weeks and it was mine. And I've spent the past 12 years remodeling. <laughs> Praise, God. Praise God. Because unfortunately I had prayed, Lord, I would like to learn some skills that other men have. Like, you know, a little minor plumbing, maybe a little electric or some carpentry, a little repair work. That would be nice. I only prayed that prayer one time, but I tell you, he's been answering it for about 14 years now, and uh, I have learned a lot of skills that I did not learn in medical school. I, I may have time to show you pictures later on of the place, um, but it, the process has helped me think about how the Lord wants to remodel us. Amen. We are really broken down, and if you want to bring people to a, a wellness center, you need to highlight that for them. The Lord has great plans for you. And yes, you're broken down, you're sick, you, you, there's a lot of room for improvement in your lifestyle, but I can show them around my place. And I have books, actually, I have a book and then a collection of photos of before and after. And they look and they say, wow, this is an incredible place. You should charge more for me to stay here. No kidding, they, they actually tell me that. And, but I say, I look at these pictures. This was a complete disaster. I later learned it had been vandalized. 
a lot of the copper was stolen. The wires were stolen, some pipes were stolen, condenser coils from AC units were stolen for methamphetamine manufacturer funding, which is a hot item in Cumberland County. And it was before the time that you had to give your fingerprints to sell copper. The law enforcement kind of caught into what was going on. But I lost so much stuff there, and I didn't know it. Before, before I had purchased it, so much had been lost that that is why the initial sale price on my property had been $900,000. But over time, it had been occupied by squatters, vandalism had occurred, and there was no livable space remaining. I didn't know that. <laughs> I just knew it was cheap. <laughs> and I had like seven to 75 hundred square feet of usable space. Uh, but the Lord saw fit to, to show me uh, an electrical inspection slip that was in one of the power boxes that had a name on it, Russell Warner. And so I asked around, I found the man named Russell Warner, contacted him and said, hey, did you do the wiring at this place? He said, yeah, that was the hardest job I've done in my life. I kind of cringed and I said, well, could I convince you to do it again because someone has stripped the wires? And he says, yeah, I know, because I believe he knows who did it, and he's never told me. But uh, he did rewire the house. I got some help, and I worked on uh, creating a home sanitarium, which I now call the Doctor's Inn. Let me show you a few pictures of that and continue with um, some of the stories I want to show you. Let's switch to this presentation here. Okay, take a, take a break, take a deep breath, stand up. Let's see what time it is. How long did that take me? About 20, 30 minutes, hopefully, on that kind of intro. So that's kind of how the Lord uh, brought me to my country property. It was not ideal, but He saved me a lot of money because He knew I was going to need to spend it um, on the remodel. Um, another promise I had uh, claimed. There's a promise in uh, the Gospels where... You know, the disciples come and say, we've left everything for you. Um, and he says, don't worry. There's no man who's left father or mother, houses or land that will not um, get that back a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come, eternal life. Do you remember, am I misquoting that? Is everybody kind of familiar with that, that uh, incident? And so uh, I, I asked if the Lord would do that for me. That was before I found this place. And so it turns out that I had spent about $30,000 in Africa building a clinic, a mission hospital. And so at this point in time, at the height of the pandemic, my property was close to $3 million. So because now I have 10 acres. I started out with five and a quarter, now I have 10, and there's some water on it, and there's a well, and there's this wonderful like mini farm, and then the big sanatorium. So that's about 100 fold. So I can assure you the Lord's word is true. That uh, if you, if you, because he says, if you leave us for my sake in the gospel, it's not like you can just spend $30,000 on a tractor and say, Lord, would you give me a hundredfold back? And you, you need to put that into the Lord's work before you should expect him to fulfill that promise for you. Of course, I don't really care. You can sit down or you can stand. It doesn't matter to me. He, uh, he put that back in so that the home sanitarium can be used for the furtherance of the gospel. So I, I do have people come to stay with me and learn a little bit about lifestyle medicine, because that's my second board. I'm board certified in anesthesiology, and then I got a second board in lifestyle medicine in 2019, along with um, the encouragement of my friend and classmate, Dr. John Kelly, who founded the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And uh, some more details, if you're interested, you can hear me talk about it. Um, here, it's on Audioverse. If you just do a search, I think this was the Amen Conference in 2015. Yeah, there it is. Uh, Amen Conference 2015 called Cross Training. Cross Training. Cross Training was the name of that particular year's conference. Cross as in the cross of Christ. Cross Training. And so I made a presentation there called Establishing Home Sanitariums, a Sanctioned, Scalable, Sustainable Plan. I'll refer you to that and try not to repeat too many elements of that today and just kind of take you to what I do at the Doctor's Inn. My philosophy as far as using food as medicine, and I do believe that diet is one of the most powerful of the eight laws of health, 
and most important of the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. And my personal philosophy as I apply it to what I do is I like to use food that is locally grown. Uh, I'm not too um, fascist on using organic. Uh, I prefer it. But as I've learned from the guys at AdAgra and other people who grow organically, it's there's not a huge difference between organic produce in the store compared to non-organic food. But if you grow it locally, there's a big difference. So I like locally grown. I think it tastes a whole lot better. Uh, the cost is a lot lower if you're growing your stuff as opposed to buying organic. Um, I try to process all this stuff that I feed people as little as possible because there's a lot better therapeutic value in the, in the outcomes that I see people experience in short period of times when they stay with me. And then I think I need to do things that it's highly probable that they will replicate when they leave. So I, tr I love gourmet type fancy beautiful food and presentation is really important. But when I do like a cooking demo or demonstrations and show them how we prepare the food that they're eating, I try to keep it pretty easy because if it's not, they're not going to do it when they go home. And if they don't do that when they go home, they lose the therapeutic value. And then like they've wasted a lot of time and they've wasted some time and money with me. So I try not to go overboard with that kind of stuff. Here's a side view of the doctor's in. Um, and I was, of course, focusing on the garden. Um, oh, let me go back. Um, you can barely even see the actual cabin that's 2,000 square feet, What you're kind of seeing there behind the fruit trees. Those are apple trees, which I mentioned I was praying for would already be there and growing because I'm not really good with fruit trees. Um, they're gone now because I have a strong preference for berries compared to trees. And you can kind of see the corn patch and the pole beans and then the bush beans. And then there's a, a vineyard that you can't see real well on those T-posts in the bottom left-hand corner of the, of, the, of the image that my mother, who's here, she started those by, seed, by hand in, from seed from uh, Carmichael? Was it here? Michael Carlton, who was, is? Is he in Greenville still? Okay, yeah, so we got, we got some stuff from him if you want vineyard stuff, he would be the guy to talk to. And then you see the woodshed, on the smaller woodshed you see, well it's actually not small, but it, it's smaller <laughs> in the picture, because I heat with wood. And those of you who are going to go to Ad Agra next time, I have a, a lecture coming up at Ad Agra on how to, how to heat with wood, because it is not easy, and it's time consuming, and you don't know what you're doing until you do it for a few years. And so that was another reason uh, I wanted to go to the country sooner rather than later, because I wanted time to make mistakes. Um, you need time to make mistakes because otherwise you're going to get real discouraged and frustrated and seeing and comparing yourself with other people like, man, they make it look so easy. It's because they've, doing, they've done it a lot longer than you and they've already made the mistakes that you're hip deep in. I started with raised beds. I moved to open plots. I really liked the greenhouses. I had to learn how to compost, which I didn't like or know how to do initially. Uh, starting to do more electric fencing for the varmints. I, I like the smaller fruits as opposed to the trees because um, it's just been really hard for me in my climate to prevent the blossoms from getting hit by a late frost, losing the whole crop by May or June. And even when I don't, the uh, insects and the deer will come get my tree fruit before it's even ripe. So I've kind of given up on the trees and moved more towards um, small fruits. And I got the idea from Spirit of Prophecy where she talks about growing vegetables and small fruits. For me, the, uh, the brambles, they grow like weeds. It's easy to propagate. I don't have to pay $8 at Lowe's for a little scraggly, you know, start of a raspberry plant. I'm, I'm, like, I'm walking over them in my weed path. I, I give them away. It's like zero cost. The pests and varmint don't get my blackberry, raspberries really at all. I have blueberries too. I started with summer vegetables and now I really prefer winter, spring, and fall gardening. The insects are a lot less in, in, intensive. The, the heat is a lot easier to work in in spring compared to summer. Uh, I, I prefer the food that I grow in spring, fall, and winter compared to summer. 
so I'm doing a lot more winter, spring, and fall gardening compared to what I started out was just one crop in summertime. I mean, that's what I remembered as a kid, and that's what I had the most experience with. But if you want to grow enough food to support yourself, you cannot just have one harvest in August. I mean, it's just, it's just not enough food. People who try to do that will tell you um, it's not a good plan. And historically, if you look at societies who feed themselves, starvation usually occurs in April because they kind of eke, eke out an existence through winter and there's just not enough sunlight and growing time before they actually die of starvation um, before crops are harvestable in, say, late May, June, July. So you need to learn how to do some winter, spring, and fall gardening. Um, raised beds, yeah, I, so I switched out of the raised beds. It was just a really kind of a small footprint in a raised bed compared to open fields that were a lot lower cost for me to create, but they were more vulnerable to uh, deer, woodchuck, rabbits, things like that. And of course, then you have to fence around that larger area and it, it took me a lot more amendments to kind of build up the soil. My soil here is probably not much better than around here. We have about four inches of topsoil, and then you hit the Cumberland Plateau. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just rock. And so I had to spend a fair amount of time building up my soil at the Doctor's Inn. And you can kind of see those areas th with this uh, bird's eye view of, of some of the garden area I've got going now. I really like the greenhouses now. I, um, I think you have more control over the conditions and the better you control the conditions of the plant, the better your production becomes. So my, my yields go up with a smaller footprint. I can also extend my seasons both on the early and late shoulders, early into the spring and later into the fall and winter. It's really nice because I'm working at the hospital still to earn a living that even when the weather is bad, it doesn't matter because I can work in the rain inside the greenhouse. It doesn't really matter. And of course, I really like the winter, uh, overwintering stuff and harvesting things around Christmas and January, um, and not having to actually weed it for a month or two. <laughs> That's one of my favorite parts. So I, at the conference, I gave a couple of references of what I grow. If you want to know what I do with berries, I like the thornless Joan Jays and then the prelude raspberries. This is actually what my raspberries look like right now. And I, get, I got my stock from Norris Farms. I think I already mentioned I really have almost no insect or varmint issues on these plants at all. And uh, for the um, Joan Jays, I have no late freeze issues because they just haven't blossomed when our late freezes hit in May. So I like those two breeds. I use them a lot. Um, but not only is fruit important, you need grains. And in my part of the country, I don't have any success really with wheat or oats. Uh, some people in Tennessee have done okay with wheat and oats. I'm not one of them. And so the corn is the main thing that in my region is easy, easy to grow. And so the, the three varieties that I like, or my two favorite would be gourd seed and Tennessee red cob. They take a long time to grow, um, about 120 days. And I let them dry outside before bringing them inside when I'm starting the wood stove in the fall, October, November. And I can dry that stuff out without worrying about any of the smut or mold or junk that will get on the corn, uh, that has gotten on my corn when I planted it maybe a little too early. I started planting my corn later in June. I've even planted as late as 4th of July. And I discovered serendipitously when I planted late, the insect pressure wasn't really bad at all, and the raccoons and other things had found other plants to eat, and they, they, did, they just didn't seem to get into my corn patch the way they did when I planted early. And when I planted early, it wasn't cold and the days weren't short enough or dry enough for the ears to dry well on the stalk, and they were getting just all kinds of weird mold and smut growing on it, and I was losing ears. But when I planted late, I just didn't have that problem. These varieties really shell easy by hand. You know, I, I can pick up those ears of corn just in, hand, in my hand and just rub them with a single hand and the kernels just fall right out and I'm ready to mill them. And, and the seeds save real well for me. So I use a um, 
I use a wonder mill to grind this up and a lot of my guests absolutely love the cornbread I make with my homegrown corn and then there's corn muffins for breakfast. I use the cornbread usually for a dinner meal with some of the beans that we grow. And it goes over really well because if, you've, if you're accustomed to eating corn from the store, that's like a food-like substance in my opinion. It's not really food, it's a food-like substance. And I've let people taste store-bought corn and cornmeal next to my corn and cornmeal as incomparable and you'll never go back. And I, I, I will not eat corn from the store. A, because it's probably GMO whether they tell you or not, and it's covered with glyphosate, uh, Roundup. And um, so I say grow your own. It's not hard to grow corn, but it is a heavy feeder, so you're gonna have to fertilize it a lot. Give it, uh, give it whatever source of nitrogen you deem fit, and it will do well. So corn, Tennessee red cob, gourd seed, and this is Kentucky rainbow. That does well too. Kentucky Rainbow is an open pollinated uh, hybrid that involves, uh, I think, Bloody Butcher. As you can see one ear there that is almost 100% Bloody Butcher, that red stuff there. And then there's some blue uh, corn, and then I think it, there's maybe some Hickory King or Hickory Cane in Kentucky Rainbow. So that's, that's a good variety that grows well in my region too. Spinach is a big one. I have a really good spinach soup recipe that we love and that our guests have really enjoyed eating our spinach soup. Low calorie, high levels of nutrition, an easy recipe they can do when they leave and they go home for themselves. It mixes really well, or is served really well with the corn bread that we make. I found this a little tricky to get it to sprout for, for me. So it's a little tricky growth curve, uh, learning curve on the growth. I've typed that wrong. I, for me, what I started doing was, um, sprouting indoors in the fall and then transplanting out. Um, the spring is a lot easier for me when I direct sow. I don't seem to have as much trouble, but I'm really interested in the fall crop because the best flavor I found is the winter spinach. Once the, the, the spinach leaves mature in, for me, May, June, and it starts to bolt, the, flavor dis the, the good flavor dissipates. It's, it's not bad, but that really sweet knock your sauce off I can't believe this is spinach that comes in January December February I gotta plant that in August September and October I plant it as late as November as well because it doesn't take you know so long to mature but winter is where I like my greens grown I do grow some in spring I got kale coming in now I got spinach coming in now but the flavor is noticeably different and I've learned uh, to particularly kale, I'll de we'll dehydrate it. We'll, we'll pick the kale leaves, we'll dehydrate it. We can fit a 100 foot row of kale in a quart jar after dehydrating it, pulverizing it in the Vitamix, and then I'll scoop that and make green smoothies throughout the year, and the flavor still is good. It's not bitter the way it is if it's fresh in May, June, July. So that's kind of how I've learned to do it. Uh, so it's nutrient dense, but uh, spinach has a lot of oxalates and that can be a real problem for some people. And that's why I like kale instead for some applications because it's very low in oxalic acid. It's also very good with cold tolerance. And it's a really good uh, single choice if you want high nutrient and therapeutic value for people. Um, we had Caldwell Eshelstein at the last ACLM conference review some of the chemistry that uh, kale gives you, it's really good for promoting nitric oxide. And um, maybe we'll go into more detail. If someone will help me remember in the afternoon session, I'll just give some kind of shorter five minute topics. One I'll cover is COVID-19. A lot of people want to know kind of my opinion and what I've seen and done with COVID-19. Um, but COVID-19 as a preview is really a vasculitides. It's one of the vascular diseases. It happens to be transmitted through a respiratory route, but it is a vasculitis, and that's why it killed people as a stroke, or they'll bleed to death, or they'll have a heart attack, or they'll go into renal failure, and you see all these weird bleedings. It's a vasculitis, but it just happens to be that it's transmissible through um, aerosolized particles. But uh, nitric oxide can be produced easily by eating raw kale with an acidic additive. Most people like um, lemon juice.
But your stomach acid works pretty good too. But, but if you eat it raw, it really uh, bumps up your nitric oxide production, and that's really important for vascular health and such. So we can talk more about that later, but that's one reason why I like to grow a lot of kale. I like the curly kale. It's got a great flavor, and it works really well in my greenhouse through the winter months. Uh, I'll give you one case example of somebody who came and stayed with me who was having some trouble. Um, this person uh, wanted to lose about 20 pounds to get closer to his ideal body weight. They had high blood pressure. They were on a beta blocker. They had been told for 10 years by their doctor that they were pre-diabetic but had done nothing about it, neither them nor their physician. Um, the lipid profile was typical for the standard American diet and turned out that he had really low vitamin D level. You want 30 or above minimum and uh, they measured out at 29. So after 10 days, uh, so you have the admission values there in the center. Uh, on the right hand side was uh, 10 day, sorry that's eight days. They're with me for 10 days but we have to draw labs on the eighth day so the results are ready by the time they drive home. So he had lost 11 pounds. Um, his blood pressure was normalized. We either cut his blood pressure pills in half or we stopped him. I can't remember. Do you remember? I can't remember. He either cut it in half or we got rid of them all together. <clears throat> A1C and sugars didn't change that much, but he was. He did now have a fasting blood sugar that would no longer give him the diagnosis of prediabetes. 100 is the cutoff. So he was, he for years, been over 100, which you see the blood sugar there, 101 on admission. Uh, that's a fasting blood sugar. It should be less than 100. He fell below 100. His cholesterols really came down nicely. His triglycerides were cut almost, you know, like 40%. So he was very pleased and he continued to lose weight the following month when I checked on him. He was, his target was 180 and he was about 190 in three months. So he did real well on a whole food plant-based diet. I have a note there at the bottom of the left screen to remind me. We used a ketometer on him and we measured up what's called a HOMO IR. I don't know if I want to get too much into that. Um, I do want to show you this. I choose to use um, a transcutaneous blood sugar monitor on people who come that I fast. This particular person was highly motivated and we didn't just use a whole food plant-based diet on him. We actually water fasted him for three days when he first came to kind of jumpstart his program and to maximize the insulin sensitivity that he was going to have while he was with us. This, these were some of his baselines before he came. You can see that throughout the day he easily jumps out of normal range when he eats. Uh, there was one day on May 20 where he was over 250 on his post uh, perennial blood sugars. But he would routinely go over 200. And um, when he came we started a three-day water fast. That's the three charts that are larger on the lower part of the screen. I just left uh, in smaller images above for comparison his baseline sugars. So you can see what happens when you go on a medically supervised uh, water fast. Your blood sugars really just kind of level out and flatline. It's not particularly dangerous if you know how to do it. And if you're watching what's happening, it goes quite well. After he passed the 36 hour mark, he never had any sensation of hunger whatsoever. And is anybody here worried or have ever not done a water fast and you worry that your blood sugar is going to go low and you worry and are afraid that you're going to be hungry all the time? Some people, a lot, a lot of people I talk to have those worries. But the truth is what happens once you run out of carbohydrates, which takes most of us about a day, and your body transitions to fat met metabolism, you're no longer hungry. It just, you just don't feel that because you're well fueled with a different, a different fuel source. And much of the hunger sensation comes from high insulin levels. And so once the carb level drops and the insulin level drops and your ghrelin and all these other hormones and things go to a, a ketosis setting, it's really not bad at all. People really feel good. He was always saying, man, I feel great. I can't believe this. I can, I, and I'm thinking, a lot of people say they think clearer. They're just their thought process change, abilities change a little bit. 
and he actually had energy to exercise, which is how he could lose a pound a day, basically, and keep losing it after he left. Um, when we started his whole food plant-based diet, he never came out of uh, target range, the green range on his, uh, on his transcutaneous glucose monitor. He did just fine. And then he said, you know, I, I feel so good, I want to do another fast. And so he did that on the third graph there on May 28. And his blood sugar barely came over 100 the, the whole time. And then he finished out and he went home and he accidentally bumped his arm on the door frame of his house and his sensor fell off <laughs> on the last day graph. That's why you see it kind of plummet because <laughs> the sensor had come off and it still recorded into his, um, into his phone. He was, he was sending me screenshots of his, of his data. So that's what I do at my place. I do a lot of um, eight laws of health, but we refer to it as the pillars of lifestyle medicine where we focus on sleep, good exercise, a great diet that tastes great and is less filling, no more filling, and um, stress management. I don't have good internet access at my place so people can't come and like sit on their phone or do their business remotely easily. And um, we take them out in the garden, let them eat straight out of that, show them how to fix some simple recipes. And then I get people to help me who like arrange it on the table in this gorgeous setting because I normally just eat in front of the sink out of my plate. <laughs> I don't really tend to sit down much to eat. But the setting is important. If you're going to do a home sanitarium, it doesn't have to be fancy like mine, but it needs to be inviting and pleasant and an environment that people like to be in. You know, I didn't start doing this a long time ago. I started with just an Airbnb site. I hadn't even, I had barely remodeled one room. But the first room I got into suitable condition, I listed on Airbnb so I could fund the bill from Lowe's <laughs> that I had for all my remodeling uh, needs, right? Never stop improving. And um, so I would just have people, secular people out of the world, come with no expectation of having any lifestyle medicine, any laws of health, anything. But because I gave them breakfast, because it's an Airbnb, and they're having breakfast with a doctor who's feeding them a healthy diet, it was very easy to start answering questions and opening up discussion about health-related topics. And there were usually hikers and tree huggers who wanted to see the falls and the various parks in Middle Tennessee. And so they would say for a night or two, it was not an immersion program, but it was a, that was kind of how I started, uh, getting people to come, and then word was kind of spreading. And I think I got up to like 52 five-star reviews on Airbnb. My listing is snoozed right now because I'm just so busy I can't take anybody in. And I plan my 10-day immersions well in, advan in advance so I can get people to come, uh, what we call a flash team, flash mob team, to do an immersion program like Dr. Kelly, uh, Gabriella down in, at uh, Greg Steinke's clinic in Chattanooga will come up and help. I'm trying to see if I can get church members to help because I want them to start getting involved in doing health evangelism and health ministry too. But that's how I started. I started small. I started with property that I bought for $112,000. Um, you don't have to be a rich doctor to do this. Uh, you can do it with a home with a spare bedroom and a bathroom with hot water and a kitchen with some healthy food and just a warm, comfortable environment that you can sit and talk with people about the stress in their life. And that is how I recommend starting a home-style sanitarium setting. You don't need 7,000 square feet. You, don't, you just need willingness to do something for someone who might have an interest in what you're doing. And th like I said, my guests didn't even know they were coming to stay with an Adventist. But they liked it. And if you treat them well and treat them like Christ would treat them, they want to come back. They rave and put five-star reviews about the experience they have with you. Even though you're not like an official lifestyle center like Weimar or Wildwood or Uchi Pines, you can still provide an experience very similar to that with little to no um, budget. Okay, let's take some questions. So there's a question here. So how many, uh, how many beds do you have and how many... I have my bed and I'm the staff. <laughs> That's the standard. So that was, that was one advantage to doing Airbnb in the house that I owned and lived in. A lesson from the pandemic is, I don't know if you know this, anybody here do Airbnb, host as Airbnb host? Okay, two-thirds of all of Airbnb's business 
disappeared during the pandemic and it has not come back because most of the Airbnb people had bought and mortgaged a property and were using the guests to pay the bills. And when the guests were banned from traveling, their business went under. But I live at my business. I don't have overhead. This is my house. And so when I lost all the business, I didn't go bankrupt because I always live there. I always sleep there. I always eat there. I always pay the bills there. So I always have a, I always meet budget no matter who comes and when. If I want to scale up, then I can find people to volunteer for me and figure out, well, what are we going to charge them? Do you want to get paid? How much do you want? How long can you stay? How does that impact what therapies we give? Who's going to do massage? Who's going to do the sauna or the, these kind of things? Uh, how many meals will we cook? Are people coming for a water fast where we have like no work to do at all? Just make sure they don't die on us, right? They don't die, but they get hungry for the first day and then they like it. You know, so I, 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 I'm very fluid and flexible with how I do my things. I don't have a standard program that I offer, which is another reason why I don't really have, I mean, I have a website, but I don't tell anybody about it. I'll tell you, it's franklincobosmd.com. And I haven't changed it for like eight years, so it's way out of date. But I do have a website, and, but it's mostly all word of mouth. People will get referred to me. And um, that's, how I, that's how I do it. So how many beds do you have? Sorry, beds. So there are, I think we counted this up recently. I have easily enough room for 10 guests to sleep. And that's without, you know, bring in, I'm actually building, I build beds now. I build beds, tables, chairs, stools inches. I learned to build a lot of stuff at this property because I, you know, as you look at how to furnish a home and you're going to buy that furniture, it's five to ten thousand dollars to buy furniture for a typical bedroom. I wasn't going to spend that on 12 rooms. You know, so I, I build my stuff and so I can build a queen, I can build a king, I can build the twin, I can do bunks, whatever. But I also learned that once you hit the seven-ish range of the guests around there, once you pass that, you're starting to look at doubling your staff. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have enough room for that many guests and that many staff. So another quote I don't have on the screen. That I think it's in seventh volume of the testimony, somewhere around page 100 and something. But I think I bring it up in the Amen conference. If you, if you listen to that, I think I have the reference in there. The uh, Ellen White counsels us that we should be watching for property and that it will be sold to us at a greatly reduced price. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about that quote until after I bought my property at a greatly reduced price. It brought me to tears that I had, I had been part of a fulfilled prophecy that she made. I found another one when I found that that says we should be watching for adjacent property for staff and others. And so last year because I was watching for adjacent property, I got a phone call and said, hey doc, we hear you might be interested in buying the house across the street. Do you want to talk? I said, yes, this is it. Answer to prayer, fulfillment of prophecy. So I bought the house across the street, which my mother now lives in, and we have space for a renter who's in it currently, and two other rooms for staff who come to help, and a hookup for an RV with 50 amp service and the sewage. And I purchased that for less money than people are paying to have land leveled and a foundation put in. It was a greatly reduced price. And so now I have room for staff that now leaves me 10 spaces for guests. But now what I've learned is 10 spaces for guests, two meals a day in my kitchen is challenging. I much prefer the six to eight range. It's just easier to do with the number of people I have that come to work with me. But I can, I, I've actually had as many as 14 to have, you know, stay, sleep, and have breakfast the next day. And I'm glad I don't do that frequently. I see a hand there. Oh, sorry, so the question was how many beds and what kind of capacity I have, so that's why I was talking about that. Another question, and I'll repeat it.
and maintenance on the house and be a dad and be a husband and you know, what do you find the time? I have the same 24 hours. He's asking about how do you find the time to do all these things? I never married and I have no children. That was key. I'm, I'm just, I'm not saying that children aren't a blessing from the Lord. I'm not saying that an elder, which I am, shouldn't be the husband of one wife. You should. Um, but I, I happened to marry my job. I just loved it that much. Uh, we've had a rocky relationship and I've broken it off recently because I burned out. So I continue, I mentioned I've done travel medicine for almost 15, 16 years. I have, for, those, for that period of time, I have had the ability to say, no, I'm not working for you. It is very liberating, it's intoxicating. I will never work for someone else ever again in my entire life. I get to choose when I work. And I know what I'm gonna get paid ahead of time so I can set my budget. I've been out of debt for years. I don't have to pay bills. I do have to pay for the gas and the water and electric, but that's pretty nominal. Um, so I get to decide when I work at the hospital and when I don't. Um, I, you do have to be very, um, I've become really protective of my time. I mean, so you saw that wood. You know, I have probably, I don't know how many cord of wood I have ready to go. But I started chopping wood for 30 minutes after every supper in the summer. Because you really need to have that wood dry about nine months before you want to burn it. And so for much of the year, I would spend 30 minutes uh, in the evening. I, I don't have a TV. I don't t look at the internet that much. And you know, if you look at the stats, most people are spending five hours of their life on a phone. You know, you can do a lot in life with five hours if you, if you don't, have a phone, I, or don't have a phone with you. So I, I, I chainsaw, I do my chainsaw maintenance, I split wood, I do all, most all my garden work now alone. I used to have somebody renting in the garage apartment who helped a lot, about 10 hours a week. But 10 hours a week with two people, you can, you can, you can accomplish a lot of painting, a lot of sawing, a lot of sanding, a lot of staining, a lot of screwing and bolting beds together, a lot of uh, finishing the floors and, and drywall repair. You know, I, I remodeled the house that my mom is in here now over the past year in my spare time while the church didn't have a pastor and I'm the head elder and so I'm serving as the pastor in my spare time. So it just goes to show the value of fatherhood and children. That's, that's the price and it's very valuable. But I don't have that in my life. And so I'm doing other things. And there's value to that too. So don't, don't think that you, you can't or shouldn't do some things, but realize that your priorities should and are different than mine. And so uh, I just hope that you're encouraged that you can do other things, more things and better, but don't do it at the cost of other responsibilities that are, are as important and as great as what you see me doing uh, by myself in all this free time that maybe you feel you don't have. Was that helpful? Any follow-up questions or anything? But yeah, I have no minute is left unspared. When I get up in the morning, I have things to do. And when I'm done, I actually fall unconscious at night. I sometimes worry that I'm rude to other people because I, I have a schedule. My, I have a nine to five job. It is a 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. job. I sleep. <laughs> I, I sleep and I don't want you messing with that job. So I will not answer the phone after a certain time in the evening. I will not deal with emails. I will not have pleasantries and conversation with you because I have a job to do from 9 to 5 every night. Yes, another question here. Correct. Great comment, which is you don't have to do this by yourself. I chose to do it by myself because I get sick of people at work. And it was therapeutic for me to leave the hospital and be alone in the woods without people um, giving me all their serious, complicated life problems. I mean, literally. Um, but yes, it's taken me 10 years to come to the point where I wish I had uh, somebody regularly helping me. And so that's a hot topic at Ad Agra. A lot, a lot of single people come to Ad Agra hoping and asking for advice and help 
because they're going it alone. A lot of single mothers, a lot of divorcees, a lot of widows, and uh, young people who just don't have the skills and experience to be efficient in the use of their time. And so they can see that if I move to the country, <clears throat> and now that I'm here, I don't know what I'm doing, and I got nobody to help me. And it's just frightening. So I may, <coughs> I may actually start having people come for reasons other than lifestyle. People who want to learn how to homestead. And uh, because then when you have multiple people helping, you can actually get a lot done and people learn how to do things. So um, fortunately now, another elder at the church who came, as he got out of the city of Orlando, lives two miles from me and he started a mini farm. And so he's kind of taken over the agricultural pursuit of things, and I can do more of the medical pursuit of things, and we're working more as a team. Then another family has come out of Chicago. We're helping them, and they're helping us. He's big into solar, so he's kind of doing the off-grid stuff. So families have kind of come to the Crossville Church over the past three, four, five years, who now we've formed what we call the Garden Interest Group. And the Garden Interest Group now has like 40 people coming regularly who meet at different households or homesteads to have a lot of fun, learn from each other, trade ideas, trade skills, share, carry the burdens, erect a greenhouse together in, you know, an hour instead of five days alone. And we're helping each other and working more as a community rather than just kind of going and seeing what this one guy does and then going to see what that one guy does, trying to do it more as a group. So, um, one word of caution, and this is my opinion, maybe we can close with this, is that, um, you know, we mentioned the idea of people coming to stay with you on your, your homestead or your, your property and coming to learn. <clears throat> I have found, I think that's great, and I, I want to do stuff like that too. But have, have any of you also heard people say to you or talk in conversation with others, yeah, I know Sunday law is coming and we should be leaving the cities, but when that time comes, I'm just going to come live with you. <laughs> you laugh because you've heard it so many times and you know that's the most stupid, foolish plan you could come up with. My question is, what are you going to say to them when they do that? I'm afraid that's what I'm going to have to say too. Because what they've done is they have planned to be disobedient. Their intent is to not follow the counsel until they believe it's almost too late. And then they know they're going to panic and they feel like you are the solution to their spiritual lethargy. And I'm going to tell them, you are not going to survive on my property. I will work you to death the first day. And you will not want to stay with me, even if you come without my permission. You're not going to like the cold showers. You're not going to like splitting wood by hand. You're not going to you're not going to like it and you are not going to be at the doctor's inn. And maybe that sounds ornery and, and hateful and unchristlike, but I don't have room for those people. I have room for others who didn't know the truth, who didn't know any better, who didn't have who now have no time to prepare but they want out of the cities. But the people who look at me and say I'm just going to come to your place when the time comes. I'm afraid there'll be no room in the inn. How much more time or questions do you want to take here? I'm fine. I'm not hungry. I can fast for days. But I saw a hand here. You had said that um, you don't do fruit trees, you do small fruit. I do. Right. I wish I could do the big tree, but I'm just not good at it. Small fruits are uh, raspberries, blackberries, black raspberries. I do I blue, blueberries. Um, I do um, I do grapes. I do um, what's another one? We're trying to do. Yeah, I do strawberries this year. I got some strawberries from the Dysingers. Uh, those did really well after the deer mowed them flush with the ground in February. Um, I don't do plums. So a, a, li a little caveat, you know, you're at Greenville, I think you're how many feet elevation above sea level? I can't remember. But up where I am, I'm about 1,900 feet on the plateau in Middle Tennessee. A very different climate than Nashville, Knoxville, Chattanooga, and most of the rest of the state. So we regularly get frosts in May. 
And so when the, the fruit trees bloom in late March, April, all those blossoms are going to get frozen off. And so it's just a waste of time, energy, money, and space for me to do most of the fruit trees, like apples, plums. Now, there are some varieties that, that bloom late, <coughs> and I'm searching for those, but I haven't found any. And it's going to take me seven, you know, five years before they start really producing much. And I, I eat regularly much more off my small fruits than I've ever eaten off my fruit trees, even on a good year. So small fruits is, how, is, what, is what I do. Nothing wrong with fruit trees, though. Follow-up question? Yeah, you also said that you prefer spring, fall, winter planting. I, I prefer spring, fall, winter planting. That's right, yes. What, um, what do you plant? My heavier crops in spring and fall would be peas, uh, peas, the leafy stuff like kale, uh, spinach, um, chard, lettuce, the lettuces, um, the cabbage, brassicas, broccoli, cauliflower, um, a lot of, uh, I've, you know, potatoes you can kind of do year round if you master that schedule. I've not done it yet. I've gotten two crops out of potatoes. You know, the Irish were masters. They get uh, three or four crops of potatoes every year. I'm not that good at it. I do sweet potatoes. Um, and then, you know, part of the joy of, of the winter fall gardening is hopefully you've done a lot of your work and you can like harvest that throughout the year and not actually have to spend time storing it or preserving it. You know, the summer crops, you're going to have to store and preserve stuff like that. You know, canning the beans, the tomatoes, uh, stuff like that, uh, sweet corn. That's why I like the dent corn because I just let it dry and then I'll grind it for flour later. Um, I like the squash because I just, you know, cut it and carefully store it and I can eat that for the next eight months, the winter squash. Um, dried beans. We're going to try to do a lot more drying of the beans rather than canning or freezing of beans this season. And then the fruit can be frozen. Deal with that easy. So I think I saw a hand over somewhere here. Yes? It was a comment. Comment. Um, regarding the people that said when they're going to come. Yes. A comment about the late, the Johnny B. Come lately. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they come for the loaves and the fishes, but they don't want to, yeah, do the work. Because it is work, I didn't, you know, I, I kind of alluded to that when I was talking at the beginning. But I felt convicted I needed to move to the country and, and make my mistakes early. I knew it was going to take a long time to kind of settle into a different lifestyle. And that if you tried to do that at the Sunday Law, it's just not going to work well and maybe we'll close with this thought. One of the key things that I learned from my friend John Kelly, who he and his wife had homesteaded for about two years straight early in their marriage. They have wonderful property, about 60 acres in Virginia. And I had asked him, John, have you grown all the food that, you, that you've eaten when you were a homesteader? And he said, well, not really. He says, you, you can't imagine how difficult it is to feed yourself 100% off your own land. So the best we could get to was 80%, and they're really good at homesteading. We got to about 80% of all the food we ate, we could grow it on site. And he said there's one drawback of that, that they discovered, because they moved to this location in Virginia at, knowing it was a dark county. They wanted to reach this county as Adventist missionaries, a couple, and a physician and his wife, right? So he said, what you're going to discover is if you actually go to the trouble of growing all your own provisions, and you come even close to 100%, we discovered we had no time left for evangelism. And it defeated the whole purpose. So he said, you know, you're going to have to be really skilled growing and taking care of yourself to have any time left whatsoever to be a light to the world around you. So I, I took that into consideration and said, oh, I need to get out there, learn some things, make a lot of mistakes, get settled in, because I'm going to need time to witness to those around me. And if I'm always weeding, if I'm always chopping wood, if I'm always playing innkeeper or personal physician to the immersion fest, I actually don't have a lot of time left to be the head elder at church or do Bible studies and stuff. So I'm trying to transition away from the phase where I spent 10 years learning how to do this on my own because I didn't have the luxury of a community around me or a wife and kids to help. 
now I can kind of say, well, I've, I've mastered all that stuff. I can do it when and where I need to. Now let's focus more on winning souls to the gospel as we're running out of time.